to wrap up chapter four, we're going to look at our last three sections uh, dealing with three different types of chemistry that happen in solution. The first one is going to be precipitation, and that'll be today. Uh, our next one, we'll do another one for acid bases, and then a last one with oxidation. To do precipitation reactions where we form solids in solution, first we have to figure out uh, what types of things make solids, which is pretty easy to do by looking at which things don't. Um, so for our purposes, the common things that are going to dissolve are nitrates, ammonium ions, sodium, potassium, lithium ions, um, and then most of our halogens. The exceptions for the halogens, and if you catch these exceptions, then you find your solids. Uh, lead ions that have like lead chloride, if it was lead nitrate, that would dissolve. Um, silver chloride, mercury chloride, some of these things when they're with halogens, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, iodine, they will not dissolve. They will be our solids. Okay, so balance the following equations. Determine if a precipitate forms. So to predict what's going to happen here, we see we have a positive and a negative ion, and another positive and negative ion, because they're ionic. So when they go in solution, then we're going to start to change places and see what they do. These are all aqueous, um, which we know means they dissociate anyway, so they're not really connected, but let's see if they can rearrange themselves. Um, if we did the lead and the chlorine together, that would be one possibility. And the second one would be the potassium and the nitrate. Um, so we put those together and we, we look at the charges to balance them. Potassium nitrate plus one minus one. All nitrates are soluble. That's aqueous. The lead and the chlorine. The lead is plus two. Chlorine is minus one, so PbCl2. And we know that all halogens are soluble unless it has lead. So that one is going to be our solid. Um, we look at the next one. Get a little more room here. Um, one possibility, we switch the ions. We have silver and bromine. And then the nitrate with the magnesium. So we rearrange those, magnesium nitrate, MgNO32. Uh, all nitrates are soluble, so that'll be aqueous. And then we get silver and bromine, um, which is a silver compound, which is not soluble, so we found that solid. Uh, we should be balancing, balancing these equations, too. If we go back to the first one, we have a coefficient of 2 there, and then a coefficient of 2 is there as well. And then down here, we would need two silver bromides and two silver nitrates. On the next one, we look at our possibilities. We switch them. We get a calcium and a chlorine possibility, iron and a hydroxide, because we have to have a positive and a negative ion in each. So calcium chloride would be CaCl2. And that is a halogen that is soluble, because it's not with one of the exceptions. So that's going to be aqueous. Um, our other one is going to be iron and hydroxide. Now, we don't have any rules with this. Um, and this is a plus 3 iron, so we need FeOH3. So that's going to be our solid. Um, we don't have any hydroxide rules specifically, um, but we know that the aqueous one, the calcium chloride, is aqueous, so the other one is going to be our solid. Um, and to balance this guy, we're going to need... Three, two, three, and two. And that'll give us everything balanced there. Um, the next one, sodium and chlorine, and then hydrogen and the hydroxide. Uh, we get those together. NaCl, that is our that's salt water. That better be soluble. Um, and then H and OH. And if you think about that one, you should come up with this, H2O. Now we got to be careful with this one. This is a this is actually another type of reaction. It's a double replacement like the rest, but it's not a precipitate um, like the other ones are forming a solid. This is just forming H2O, which is a liquid. All right. So this is an acid-base reaction making a liquid, but it's still the same idea in terms of predicting products. Uh, the double replacement, but it's not a precipitate per se. Um, here we need to write the molecular, complete ionic, and net ionic forms for each of the following equations. Let me start out with the molecular equation for just part A. We'll separate these up here. So part A, 
aqueous nickel 2 chloride reacts with aqueous sodium hydroxide. If we try to trade the partners, we would see we get Na and Cl, um, and then nickel and then the hydroxide would go together, so we would see what they would make on the other side. Um, the nickel or sodium chloride, NaCl, that's going to be aqueous, and nickel hydroxide, nickel is plus 2, that must be our precipitate. Okay, so there's our molecular equation that has everything um, as it is. The second one is the net ionic, and outside of this chapter we never really use this one, but we need it sometimes as a stepping stone to get to the last one. So the net ion, or the, I'm sorry, the complete ionic, not the net ionic, the complete ionic is going to be the one where we take everything aqueous and expand it because really these don't exist as molecules, they're dissociated. So let's expand all of these and see the complete ionic equation. When we break all of those aqueous things apart, um, we can see here we have a nickel ion, we have two chlorine ions, okay? And here with the coefficients, uh, this, this could does the same thing. Now I have two sodium ions and two hydroxide ions. On the product side, we have another the coefficient of two for our balanced equation two sodium ions, two chlorine ions, but then our solid nickel hydroxide stays a solid for our complete ionic equation. And this is going to help us get to the net equation, which is really where we need to go, and we're going to get there by canceling out some of these terms. So if something doesn't change from one side to the other, because remember those big molecules uh, up in the top don't really exist. Aqueous means they're spread out. If it's not changing from one side to the other, it's, it's not really part of the reaction, it's just kind of there. And we look at that and we can see the chlorine is part of our complete ionic, and the sodium that's part of our complete ionic, two sodiums and two chlorines on either side, they aren't doing anything. So what we're reduced to is for our net ionic equation is a nickel two plus ion and two hydroxides. This is really all that's happening are making a solid. And there's, there's times where this is going to be very useful to see the net ionic equation. So that's for um, part A. Okay. <clears throat> for part B, let's kind of move this slide down here to get rid of that. Um, we get another equation, solid potassium reacts with water to make aqueous potassium hydroxide and hydrogen gas, which is diatomic H2. If we look at the phases of all of these, um, we have solid, liquid, aqueous, and gas. To get to the complete ionic equation, the only thing we could really do here is separate our potassium hydroxide into a K plus aqueous and an OH minus aqueous. Um, and if we bring everything else down, that would give us our complete ionic equation. Um, but nothing can cancel out in this one because the phases are changing for everything. So this would also, once we expand the potassium hydroxide, that would also be our net ionic equation as well because there's nothing to cancel out. So not everything is going to be reducible, but all the precipitation reactions where we're making solids from two aqueous things are going to give us a really good um, reducible equation, kind of like we had down here in part A with the nickel hydroxide. and The net ionic focuses us on how we make the solid. Okay, for our last problem for this section, we're going to just start into 4.7 because we can see how we use solubility and precipitates to analyze samples. So we have an unknown, an ore, like a rock you'd pull out of the ground, to be analyzed for sulfur. Uh, as part of the procedure, the ore is dissolved, and all of the sulfur is now converted into sulfate, SO42-. Um, and here's where the precipitation comes in. Barium nitrate, soluble, 
is added, which causes the sulfate to precipitate as barium sulfate, which is now insoluble. So all of the sulfur that was in the ore is now in a precipitate barium sulfate. So we can analyze what the ore was made up of if we isolate and analyze the precipitate. So the original sample had a mass of 3.187 grams. We will come back to that towards the end because that was the ore originally. The barium sulfate had a mass of 2.005 grams. What is the percent sulfur in the ore? Um, so this is just um, almost like a percent composition problem that we had done before. When we look at the barium sulfate, we have 2.005 grams. And we want to know how much sulfur is in that. Because if I know how much sulfur is in that, it all came from the ore. So there's only one sulfur in there, which had a mass of 32.07 grams. That's the molar mass. The barium sulfate had a molar mass of 233.4 grams, um, which is going to give us 0 0.0. 0.1374, which as a percentage is 13.74%. Okay, so that's the sulfur in the barium sulfate, um, just based on their molar masses. We know that about every sample of barium sulfate because it has a definite composition. Um, so we take that, that proportion, 0 0.1374, 13.7%, and we say, okay, my barium sulfate was 2.005 grams and only 13 percent of that is sulfur therefore we have 0.2755 grams of sulfur in the precipitate okay this is from the precipitate well all of that came from the ore because we isolated it so 0.2755 grams sample that's the sulfur. Now we go back to our original sample, because the original question was how much sulfur is in the ore. And the original ore had a mass of 3.187 grams. So we have a tiny fraction of that is going to be sulfur, um, which gives us 8%, 8.6%. 4%. What is the percent sulfur in the original ore? We isolated it into the barium, find out how much of barium sulfate is sulfur, and that is our proportion of sulfur in the ore.